Hey everybody, it's Jonathan Small, and this is Right About Now. 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 I have a great episode to share with you today. We're going to revisit a conversation I had with Taffy Brodesser Ackner in 2017. It was one of the first podcasts I ever recorded. You found your voice. And you really write what you want to write rather than what other people want you to write. That's a privilege that comes after you spend a lot of time filing on time, being nice and not being a monster and compromising. And also it comes with a lot of hard work and, and being prolific is a factor. If you, in all this time, if you only wrote four stories a year, no one would know all the ways you are capable of contributing. We met at her home in New Jersey and got down and dirty about how she got started as a writer and how she has become so successful. This interview was recorded right about the time Taffy first took a full-time position at the New York Times. She had handed in her book, Fleischman is in Trouble, to her editor, but it was not yet published. And both of those things would just skyrocket for Taffy. She is now a top culture writer for the New York Times, and Fleischman is in Trouble is one of the big debut hits of 2019, and she's on all these best books of 2019 lists, and I have read the book and cannot recommend it highly enough. Taffy has promised me that she will come back onto the podcast when the book comes out in paperback, which I think is going to be in February or March. So you can look forward to some uh, very lively conversation. But until then, I think you'll find this conversation incredibly enlightening. Taffy talks about how she got into the writing business at sort of a later part of her life, how she broke in, the kinds of stories she writes. She talks about the sort of secret formula behind successful personal essays. Then she talks about how she got into writing celebrity profiles and how she approaches celebrity profiles. And then she just talks about finding her voice. Like have an intelligent conversation. Think of your reader, Jonathan Franzen says this, think of your reader as your friend. Someone who is kind of as desperate for answers as you are. Someone who is as confused and lonely and isolated and weird as you are. That's who you're writing to. You're writing to yourself. So if you miss it the first time, I think you will really enjoy this masterclass in writing with Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Seven years ago, Taffy worked as the head of education for Media Bistro, and she would hire people like me to teach writing class. And everybody loved Taffy, because like her name, she had a wild personality. She was wicked smart. She was so fun. She knew how to tell great stories. But I don't think many of us realize that deep down inside, there was this tremendous journalist waiting to burst out onto the scene. But Taffy always knew it. And she was hesitant to be a writer because she had a few bad experiences early on in her career that freaked her out. But after she had her first child, she also had an epiphany that it was now or never for her in terms of being a writer. In this interview, she shares her journey, her sort of amazing journey of how she went from somebody who would hire writers to somebody who you really want to hire as a writer. And she did it her way. And I know that sounds corny, but one of the things I've always admired about Taffy is that she writes the stories that she wants to write. She writes the stories that she's interested in. Taffy. Hello, Welcome John. to Write About Now. It's such a pleasure to be I'm here. I'm so happy to be here in Maplewood, New Jersey. Is this where you do most of your writing? I do most of my writing right off this room or in the dining room. I do it right in that office, which totally sold me on the house. When we came to see the house, I saw this room right off the dining room, meaning it wasn't like the other home offices. It wasn't like squirreled away in the basement or right. in the attic. It's and like I part thought, of the house. It's part of the house because when you work from home, You can't deny that you're in your home and you need access to the door when it rings for no good reason seven times a day. And you need access to the bathroom instead of having to leave the floor to go to the bathroom or 
to get some water because I have proven over and over that if I'm not on the same floor as water or a bathroom, I will not seek those things and it will be disastrous. Have you ever considered not working from home? Like, do you find working from home to be incredibly distracting? I complain about it a lot, but now that I've been in an office for a month, I realize it is a paradise of non-distraction. But that's because I'm social. Like it has its own, there's a, there's a dog two houses down that barks incessantly. There are UPS deliveries as if we are people who have just a subscription to something. <laughs> And the phone rings with robocalls all day. And I thought that was a nightmare. And then I went to work at the very, very quiet New York Times office. But my own social impetus, I can always find someone to have coffee with me. The water and the bathroom are a good 90 second walk away or two minute walk away. And that is also disastrous. And then I have to say hello to everyone as I come back. Although I'm sure they were like, please let us work. How did I make anything done there? People used to say about me that I was so productive, like they could not believe my productivity. And now I understand why they couldn't believe it because an office is no place, to, a job is no place to get anything done. And there are too many uh, trappings of a job, how you have to file things and the meeting you have to attend and the the social opportunities. But then every other week, a sum of money is deposited into your bank account and you're like, oh. I get it. Like, I did not have to chase this money. I did not have to call somebody and be casual about my inquiry for a check because it was very late, but also not to act desperate in any yeah. way. That's like the dance, right? Like, nobody right. knows. Yeah, that, that you, you basically are living off of fumes at this yeah, point. Yeah, and you're oh my desperate. God, this totally is a reality that nobody ever talks yeah. about. Yeah, and then like the tone of voice you have to use where you're like, you're always chasing down money as a freelancer. You're like, always. hey, I'm just checking in. Can you look into? Can you yeah. look into that? You're like your your voice goes up, and you're you hate yourself because the truth is you should be like, where the hell is that check? Right. Like this is not okay. Right. You have consumed my services. You have my goods, and my business is a home business, and yours is a corporation. Right. But the reality is, is that I remember working at Media Bistro and people asking about their checks, and you'd be like. This is not a good look for you. Whereas, yeah. like, why aren't we just cutting checks on time? <laughs> All right, let's backtrack. Let's backtrack. Because you have such an interesting story, like how this has all happened for you just in the last 10 years, I yeah, guess? Yeah, seven years. Seven, seven years. years. I've, I've only been doing this seven years. For seven years. So when I first met you, mm -hmm. it was at Doughboys in uh, yes, Los Angeles. on 3rd Street. Who we saw a cockroach. It? Do you remember that? No, we saw a cockroach. Yeah. Ew. And then we ate anyway, because we're... Animals. We, we actually ate the cock. <laughs> we probably did. <laughs> protein uh, is protein. It's protein. <laughs> so you, at that time, you were running the West Coast offices of Media Bistro. Yes. We oh. met slightly. We, that's the first time we met in person. But I had hired you before that from oh. the New York office. As I was getting ready to leave, okay. I remember you had every qualification in the world. You were the exact person I was looking for. And you just well, found you. me. You were. You were amazing. Oh. You had all the women's magazines and the lad magazines you were writing for. I had written for a lot and of And you those. were Jake. You were yes. Glamour's Jake. And that was like... The secret is out. Uh, yeah, you were Jake. And that was, was an amazing thing to me. It's like, that's Jake. And now you realize it's like every guy you bump into in Manhattan has been Jake. I've met time. four Jakes now, but you, you were <laughs> but my I first. Was, I was your first Jake. <laughs> Oh, boy. Well, it was, a, it was a great run. So Media Bistro, for those who don't know, is a... I don't... How do you explain what Media Bistro is or Media what Bistro it was? Media started as a community site for journalists. Like, our founder was a journalist who just was lonely in her home office. Right. Um, and started having parties. And then there was a job board. And then, well, why don't we It was like pre-Facebook, sort of. It was. It was yeah. pre-all social media. Oh, yeah. And it was, you can have, you can go to a party or you can take a class with your fellow journalists, meaning you wouldn't have to go to the con School of Continuing Ed at NYU to take a journalism class. If you were a mid-career journalist, we have a class for you. And people would meet and people would just sort of like the circumstance, the social circumstance. And that's what we were providing. And it was mostly a job board with all these other things. Like the job board was, I think, the thing that made the most money from what I overheard. <laughs> um, and I was one of the first few people there. 
And I had just been laid off from Soap Opera Weekly magazine. What did you do at Soap Opera Weekly? I was, they will tell you, I was their worst writer. I wrote profiles. I doubt that. No, they would. They did not enjoy me there. And they were they would be like, uh, Taffy wrote a story. I guess we're gonna be here all night. It was really kind of insane how differently I'm received now. Well, that's an interesting part of story. Um, we'll get to that, yeah. And I was laid off. It's funny, I was laid off June 5th, 2001. Really, it was a firing. It was like, we have no cause to fire you, but yeah. we just, you just don't contribute anything we want here. Like, I was not a soap opera super fan like they all were. They just didn't like me. They thought I was a snob. They thought I was above the material in some way. And I wasn't. Right. Although maybe I was. Like, if I leave room for that, I think that the thing I learned from there is that nobody wants you to write about anything about anything in the culture except as part of the community that is consuming it, right? Right. Like now, you know, I was assigned an Andy Cohen story. Uh-huh. And I, I had not been a citizen of the Real Housewives world. And I watched hundreds of episodes until I understood why people liked it, until I understood, like, you can't go into anything without understanding why people love it. Yeah, I'm the same way. I think some people are very lazy about that. Yeah, I get if I get an assignment to to interview somebody that's on a show that I've never seen, I'll watch like every every single episode, single episode right? I know. Well, and nobody wants your winky. Look how much better I am than this. Like the people I know who watch The Real Housewives, and that is a lot of people in the New York Times building. Mm-hmm. They wa- they do not watch it. Ironically, they don't yeah. hate watch it. They en- either enjoy it or they get something out of it. And like to deny that, to deny that a lot of our country is watching this is to allow you to understand more of the country, right? Yeah. That's what good culture writing is, sorry, like trying to understand why people consume what they consume, why people become famous, why we allow famous people to become famous. Like we are the ones, it's very democratic, right? We elect our famous people. You know, we watch a pilot and we either watch the second episode or we don't. So something like Nicki Minaj, who you interviewed, yeah, did you like? I wouldn't think that before you got that assignment, you were a Nicki Minaj. I was not even like Nicki Minaj so aware. Like my associations with her were that she sometimes wore pink wigs and was sometimes on Ellen, and definitely I knew she was a singer. But you know, I had small children. Yeah. I was not listening to Nicki Minaj at the time. I was not like aware of who was on the scene. There's some people, there's some culture people who just are savants. They know everything. They are on top of everything. I used to be self-conscious about it. And now I, now I wonder if it is like the thing I bring to it is like a kind of. Yeah, sort of outsider mm-hmm. coming in. But an informed yeah. outsider, right? Right. Well, by the time I yeah. get there, I am so tell me the about, fan let's club just president. And talking the, about yeah. the prepping for a Nicki Minaj interview. Like, tell me what you did to get ready What for I that. did is I read everything there was about her. And I saw that she shut down during interviews, that she was just like not. And I was like, I will be very charming. And I right. will be, I will n- like talk to her and she will not be able to resist me. I did not see her move coming, which was that she fell asleep <laughs> while we were talking. Um, <laughs> but preparing for it, I remember I was in Las Vegas on a story about Britney Spears. And there was this one Britney Spears song that there was this remix for Till the End of the World that she just has this little intro on. And... I found it the most compelling part of the song, and it's a song I really like. So I Spotified a whole Nicki Minaj thing, and I just listened and I listened. To prepare for a music story is really amazing because unlike a TV story or a movie story or a theater story, you can immerse in this way that's everywhere, meaning I'm picking up my children and I'm also listening to Nicki Minaj. I am walking down the street and I am all... And then one day you begin to understand what she is trying to tell you through Mm -hmm. her music. And when you understand that, then you understand who she wishes she were, who anyone wishes they were through their art, what they are trying to transmit to you. And now your job is to find the tension between why are they trying to be that way? Mm -hmm. What is it that drew them there? What is it that made them that way? What is it that compelled them? 
And for those who didn't read the Nicki Minaj yes. story, tell the falling asleep. She fell. She fell asleep while we were talking. She, I kept trying. She was giving me one word answers. What's not in that story is that she was very angry. She showed up, you know, thirty seven hours late or whatever. Right. Meaning, by the way, she showed up three weeks late. Like, it was like being next on an organ donation list. One day someone would call you and you'd have to go. That's yeah. how I. That's the tension I sat in for weeks. And then it was very late at night after or before, I can't remember, a rehearsal for the Fashion Rocks concert. And we were in her dressing room and she wanted her videographer to tape our interview. And I said, uh, you know, I, I wish you could, but we're not allowed to have like a double recording. No one's allowed to be in the room but us. And so she spent the first maybe 10 minutes not speaking to me at all. And I like, it was my first GQ story. That's the other thing is right. that, and all I ever wanted was to write for GQ. Like GQ was like my huge goal in life from yeah. the time I was little. Like my father had a GQ sitting in our den, like right after his divorce, he bought a GQ. Like I could even right. see what they like, I will buy a GQ. I will be a gentleman and go yeah. out in the, you know, and I just loved that magazine. And they finally called me all these years. Notice me, notice me. And right. they finally called me for a feature. And just wanted it to be so good. I just wanted it. I knew their standard. Their standard was not that they would be okay with nothing happening. She would talk to me for the first 10 minutes. And finally, I begged her. I said, please talk to me. I'm so sorry that we can't do that. I would hate for us to spend this time together. And then them say, oh, no, there's a video of it. We can't do it. Trust me. I just want to tell a good story. And right. I was freaking out. She, her back was to me. She wasn't just sitting there not talking to me. She was standing with her back to me in a totally socially inappropriate way that I was sitting on a couch and she was standing with her back to me and her, her arms crossed. And I begged her. I, I, will, like, I will say it now. I, I begged her. And... I was like, please, please. <laughs> Finally, she sat down. And then when we started talking, she would just give me one word answers because she was still annoyed. And then I noticed that her eyes were like closing. It was a very warm room. It was 11 o'clock at night. And she just was falling asleep. And I couldn't believe it. So first of all, I was freaking out. Like, how is anyone going to believe that this happened? Right. The other side of it was like, oh, no, GQ will never let me publish this story because who's going to believe it? And nothing happened. Like, they really require kind of an Something access. They want access. They right. were promised access. Being in a room with me and falling asleep did not feel to me like the access they were asking for. She fell asleep and I kept saying so that the, at least the fact checker would believe me because this was so bonkers, right? Yeah. It was like, are you okay? You're so, wow, you must be so tired. You're asleep right now. And then she like kind of jerked awake when I was like, hey, can I... I it was so crazy. Like I still like, it's such a funny story now, but... I time. can't forget how upset I was and how panicked I was. She then had this tin of M&Ms that she got from Fashion Week, like a branded tin of M&Ms. And she couldn't open it. She was like, I need some sugar. And she couldn't open them because of her nails. So I was like, I will open them and feed you these M&Ms and maybe you will be awake. But she kept falling asleep. And I left the interview ultimately. And it was at Barclays Center in Brooklyn. And I went outside and I leaned against the building like I put my forehead against the building and I cried <laughs> I cried I was like I I had my shot and it, it, was, it was over yeah and just then the entertainment booker the editor who books this stuff called me and said how was it and I was I said she fell asleep and his reaction was he said oh the poor thing she must have been so tired and just then I saw like Oh, that's how to tell this story. The story is, is that she is exhausted from being the hardest working woman in rap. She is exhausted from the amount of people who come and make demands of her, like me. And she's exhausted from her obligations, her publicity obligations, from her rehearsals. It became like a, a feminist issue to me. Like, we should all be getting more sleep. We should, like, I should, I'm tired too. What am I doing in the middle of the night? I live in New Jersey. I'm in Brooklyn. It's the middle of the night. I'm crying against a building yeah. in downtown Brooklyn. Like, this is, this, this is the story. Yeah, this is the story. And I went home and I wrote it overnight. Do you do that often? Like, like when I it's fresh it. in your head? No, no, I do do it often when it's fresh in my head. This was that she was so late that it was due two days from then. 
my first impression of you was this, you know, really smart woman who, who whose husband was a big journalist, mm-hmm. who, uh, her, her husband, Claude Brodesser, Ackner, or what he was Claude Brodesser, he was at, Claude the time. Brodesser at the time. And he had a show. Name. Yeah. And he was uh, like, what was he writing for? Variety? He was at Variety and he had a show on KCRW. Yeah, a show on KCRW. Yeah. And you were like, you weren't a journalist in my mind. You were right. Uh, right I was like a, like a like support a, staff. A support right. staff. Yeah. And you were hiring, you know, people like me to, to teach classes and, you know, cut to seven years later and you were like definitely without a doubt more successful and more prolific than any of the people that you ever hired to be a writer. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. I don't I, think of it that way. <laughs> you are. Well, I think of it that way. I mean, you've had a career to die for as a freelancer and it happened later in your life, which I think is really interesting. Not I think that that's like, how it happened that like by the time I started, I had children and by the time this is what happened to me. We did our classes, as you recall, in this big room. And the classes started at seven, but we would still be there because we were a startup and we were young and we were going out afterward anyway. And I would overhear the classes. And then I would receive emails a few weeks later. Oh, I got this published. Thank you so much for this class. Like this teacher was amazing. And I started to kind of die the slow death of jealousy of like, why did I let the people at Soap Opera Weekly tell me who I was? Like, yeah. that's really what happened to me. I Is that why you went to Media Bistro? Because you I went to Media Bistro because I have, because I, because there's a part stop. of me, like, there's a part of me that isn't like a lot of other writers. I'm very, very social and I really like yeah. to put on a show and a party. Your name is Taffy. And my name is Taffy. <laughs> Which we have to get into. Why. Okay, that's fine. <laughs> um, I saw the years going by and then I had kids and I had my older son who turns 10 tomorrow. And then on his first birthday, I decided three times a week I would get a babysitter. And I did. And the first time I just kind of stared at a wall or drove somewhere and didn't know where to go. Like I realized I don't know what to do. And then the babysitting hours were over. It was three hours, 12 to three. And I got back and I couldn't believe I had nothing to show for the time. And I thought, what are you doing? You're in your 30s now. Like this career that is floating out there in the future for you, it is not doing its its own work. And so I sat down and I got to work. I started writing essays because I couldn't do any reporting and I wasn't brave enough to do reporting. You just, um, what, what do you mean? Because you just didn't have the com- you hadn't done it. I didn't it. have the confidence. And I then you were married to a guy who was very uh, much a reporter. Very much. A, and I didn't think I could ever do the thing he does, which is call people up and look them in the eye and say, no, but you're lying. I I couldn't do that, but I could write about myself. Another thing that happened to me was that I had a very difficult birth with Ezra, my older son. And I felt like I had stories to tell about that. That's what happened to me afterward. Like the condition of my trauma was that I kept repeating it over and over. This is what happened to me. This is what happened to me until I finally wrote it down. And then I stopped feeling like I had to keep saying it. And that's what's happened to me, Mm -hmm. that I used to be someone who talked desperately trying to get people to listen. But when I quietly wrote something down, I didn't feel that desperation anymore. So So it was like a therapy almost for you. Yeah. But then I also realized, you know what? You're 33 now. Like if you want a career, you have to get it done fast. Essays did not require any kind of other people. Now I can get assigned an essay. Mm -hmm. Back then you had to write the whole thing because nobody knew what you would do with certain material. So I started writing essays. Remember, I went, you know, I went to school for screenwriting. I have a very good, I've always had a good sense of structure. I've always been a real student of, oh, this made me feel something. I'm going to go watch it again and again until I understand why it made me feel something. And so I just churned it out. I used the, I mean, in an unhealthy way. What were some of the first essays that you wrote? The, like the basic beginner pile of essays, which is like <laughs> how Facebook makes me feel, yeah. how my body makes me feel. There was a point where I was like, I saw that there was a big market for like under the category of my tortured relationship with my body. And then one day I had this great moment, maybe three years in where I said, you know what? My body has taken very good care of me. I'm going to let it off the hook and I'm going to stop writing these things because it got like gruesome, like women's magazines coming for your body. They're like, but tell us, tell us really why you hate it. Tell us the worst part of your body. And even when I would do women's magazine cover stories later, 
they would send you in with a list of questions as if you were like a robot, like not here, go find the good story. They were like, here's what you have to cover. And one of the questions for some of them were like, what is the thing about your body you hate the most? Which is not a question I would even ask one of my sisters whom I've known all my life, right? That's a really like, awkward question. It's a to really ask. horrible That's question. That's one you say for the very last as you're leaving. Right. Yeah. And you're like, I hope you don't hate yeah, me too much I after always, this. Yeah, you always give the disclaimer and yeah, and it and doesn't matter. Have, and they still get matter. it bad. They and still get upset. They still, or they yeah. feel bad for you and yeah. they answer it and then they hate themselves for answering it. Right. I've had a couple of learning experiences like that. Um, an actress I asked too much about her drug addiction. An actress I asked too much about her weight loss on the advice of the editor. And that's when I realized like these are real people. Like the rules of decency still apply. For yeah. example, I have been reading these I've been reading these Vanity Fair profiles, which are some recent ones, which are like here is the here's the beautiful person and here's what a pillow breasted like small waisted yeah. thigh gapped woman I like and you can't believe that you met someone and you sat there with them and this is what you came out with right like the rules of decency apply or people going in and saying things like feeling entitled to the information tell right. me about your relationship with that person and those are things that are arts. Those are things you have to earn. You have two, sometimes you have two hours and you still have to form something that looks like a relationship. That's what's so crazy. <laughs> so you're writing a lot of personal essays right. about yourself mm -hmm. and, and they were about your body specifically. And you were selling That's what those. people loved. People lo like that was an easy sell. Like, hey guys, I hate my body. 3,000 words. <laughs> yes. Yes. You found your thing. I did find my thing. My thing one was of, Jake. Your thing was hating. I hate my body. One of my first things, it, 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 I shouldn't even be that cynical because I pitched these. I just like was a good business person. I saw that there was an endless appetite for this. One of the times I used the babysitter to go to yoga, I went back to the yoga studio that I had been going to before I got pregnant. And there were new teachers there because it had been a while. And I was good. I was like a good yoga person. And I was still good. I wasn't as strong as I was, but I was still good. But I had gained a lot of weight in my pregnancy. And when the teacher would come around, like when we were doing some kind of pose, she would say to the other students, great, you, oh, this looks amazing. You look amazing. And to me, she would say, I like your spirit. And I, that was like my first big magazine essay I wrote. I like your spirit. It was like the most aggressive thing. Like, congratulations for showing up, you fat fucking pig. Like it was, I couldn't believe it. And it happened in every class. Like, you're an inspiration to me. They would whisper in my ear, like, why? Because because I'm doing this so well? Or right. because you can't believe I showed my face here in leggings? So and, when those kinds of things happened, you were like, I got to write about this. Like before yeah. when that would happen. When, I would when tell everyone. You I would, would just say, tell your friends. listen to what happened. And I right. had like, and I was good at storytelling. So I had a way to tell the story. Yeah. And then one day I wrote it down and I saw that that skill was transferable. I mean, it's, it's likely that my soap opera weekly profiles were terrible because I did not realize yet that you tell the story the way you would tell the story if you were looking someone in the eye like captivate them with the most interesting thing first, give a good payoff in the end. I didn't know those things yet. Right. I also went to screenwriting school and my screenplays didn't do well. And I think it's because I learned this kind of cynical way of telling a story in a movie, a three act structure, right. the, that the, kind the of formula. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Like this, so like mechanical. a save the cat kind yeah. of like, here's the dark night of the soul. Right. As opposed to like, here's what really could happen in this scenario. Right. And that's what's changed for me that like, I saw that the truth that actually the thing that the closest you can get to how you really felt at the moment was, was a thing that affected a lot of people. Yeah. So whatever was interesting or meaningful to you in an honest way would be yeah meaningful relevant to, to everyone people. because we're all the same right like yeah. we all like the same things we all feel the same we all have the same reaction to seeing the things we see and the writer's job is to use is to put words to it right you taught a class in personal essays which i always wanted to take mm -hmm. and and i remember thinking i want to write a personal essay and i called you or something and i said you know what are like the three things that i should yeah 
keep in mind and without re you know rehashing everything that you taught in that class <laughs> which is hours <laughs> which was hours and hours <laughs> but there was one thing that there has to be a change i remember you said that you have to you have to change you have to change the way i see a, a personal essay is this like a i see it as the way you tell a story meaning the way you tell a defensive story here's a problem i have is like the first part the second part is here's why it's everyone else's fault like here are the the world circumstances that right, turned that me it. into this monster you see before you and then the last part because people really will pounce on you if you take no responsibility and it's also not an essay if you take no responsibility a personal essay here's why it's really my fault like here are the ways that i could have prevented this issue or mitigated it or ameliorated it or something Here's what I learned. Here, yeah. here is here is what I contribute to it, and so instead of saying that you change, I don't actually, I don't believe in human capacity to change that much. What I do believe in is an ability to have perspective on and hate yourself a little less for the way that you are. You know, there's this like trope in especially women's magazine personal essays. These days, these days, I'm trying to be a little bit, blah. and it, it's never really, yeah. it's like, oh, so you're better now? Yeah. Does anyone ever get better? Like if I go back and read those personal essays that I was writing in 2009, I will most certainly find that I am exactly the same and maybe a little less tortured, like maybe slightly less. And also the publishing of the essay and seeing that everyone feels this way. I recently wrote a Weight Watcher story. I like came back to my body for a Weight Watchers story for the New York Times Magazine. And the amount of people who read it and who felt heard by it, that is healing. I haven't like really thought about my body in a bad way since I published it in August. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that's like a miracle for me, especially in light of the fact that I had to, I was starting a new job and for the first time had to buy more than one outfit I could be seen in, in the city. <laughs> like that was always what I had. I was like, here is my, this is go, my meeting outfit. And the rest is all like a, like a spandex blend. Right. Yeah. A big shirt and, a <laughs> and some <laughs> leggings and some sneakers. So you transition from the personal essay about your body and you start to write about different things. I what did my they, first celebrity interview when I was in LA. I had a friendship with Steve Randall, who was longtime deputy editor oh, yeah. of I Playboy. Like and I, yes, I love him. And we would have lunch once a month and I would just listen to what was going on at Playboy. And at the end, I would start throwing out a couple of names of people that he should do the Playboy interview on. Never really thinking that I was pitching. I like yeah. never thought of it that way. <laughs> I said, oh, you know, you should do this guy. You should do that. And finally, one day he said, yes, you should do that one. And I couldn't believe it. And I was like, I, I hadn't been Who really. Was it? it was Kristen Ritter, the B from Apartment 23. Yeah. But all, that's what she was doing then. But she was also Jesse's girlfriend who chokes on her own vomit in Breaking right. Bad. And she's amazing in that. And, and she's very she's striking looking. Yeah, and she's and, been yeah. an action hero too. Or yeah, something. she's yeah. Uh, Jessica Jones. So I really, really liked her and I interviewed her and I was so nervous and he gave me my chance. I did that and I started pitching myself as someone who could do that. I have this one clip and I was pitching myself at GQ. Okay. And GQ, I, I went to Did you to know York. anybody at GQ? No. I went to New York and I met with them Okay, this is what this is what I knew. I knew my friend Margaret Wappler, who lives in LA and is an excellent writer. She was an LA Times music journalist and is a novelist. She knew a woman named Mary Kay Schilling, who had been in New York but was now at GQ. And she said, You're going to New York, go meet with Mary Kay Schilling. I go to meet with Mary Kay Schilling. Mary Kay Schilling is laid off the day that I'm supposed to meet with her. And she says, You should go instead meet with Lauren Bands. He, who is still there. Right. I try to meet with Lauren Bands, who is not available that day, but we become Facebook friends or something. And right. she, because she knows I'm in LA, they send me to do an interview with Lonely Planet and Weird Al Yankovic. And I go and I do it and I turn my transcript in. That's all it was. It's a Q&A. And then they send me to do a couple of more. And then I go to meet with them in New York. And now I'm meeting with Lauren's editor, Devin Gordon, who would go on to be my editor. And I pitch him a few ideas. 
But where were you coming up with your ideas? You're so good at coming up with ideas. I'm not so good at coming up with ideas. Like, I feel like everyone at a magazine has dibs on a current hot or very famous. And so, like, the thing you have to do is have a good thought about someone who isn't specifically in demand right now. So one of my first pitches was... Chris Harrison, the host of The Bachelor. It was in its like 30th season. It had been on for 10 years. <laughs> right. It wasn't particularly but, a new thing. But I had not ever seen The Bachelor and then found it on an, in a hotel room and could not believe what I was seeing and also couldn't believe how much of an influence it had had in the culture. Meaning when I was seeing it, I knew what I was watching. I had seen references, enough references to it. And I felt like this must be affecting the way men are dating now, like, or the way, at least the way women are dating or the amount of demands you can make. And they said no to that. But they gave me these 300-word fashion profiles, which I was terrible at. I'd file them at 900 words. They would have like transitions. Of, they'd be like, no, no, no. Just write 300 words about like why this person is interesting, a few quotes. But I was like, I'm filing this as a, like a little mini feature. And they were like, no, 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 no. That's not how to do it. Yeah. But I just kept doing it and trying to be likable and trying to like... I was always on time. I did a good professional job and I was terrible. One of their editors, Devin Gordon, once could not close one of my 900 word fashion profiles. So he he sent me over to a man there named Mark Lotto. Mark Lotto and I got up to talking because I had written in the meantime, I started writing for the New York Times Magazine. I wrote my first profile on Zasha Mamet, which I know sounds crazy. Like, oh, wait, why aren't you mentioning the New York Times Magazine? Because we had started talking about GQ right. and then I became known for my GQ stuff more. But in the interim, I had been pitching a section of the New York Times Magazine to the culture editor called Riff. And it was like a counterintuitive essay. And I met with that editor and I liked him so much. We, we just hit it off. And I pitched Zasha Mamet. I was going to pitch her as an essay on the sort of strange influx of children of famous people. And like, what did it mean about us that like we could not find new undiscovered talent Mm -hmm. anymore? What I thought of as a New York Times magazine idea. (laughs) But I said Zasha Mamet and he said, that's a good idea. And I realized he was thinking of a profile and I wasn't going to, what my husband calls it, I wasn't going to write myself off the front page. So I was like, yes, that's what I'm pitching. (laughs) It got a yes. I went and I did my first profile. I handed it in. It was a disaster. But Adam Sternberg, the editor, was so kind to me. And he's like, how about we do this instead? And he said, the first section should be this. The second section should be this. The third section should be this. The fourth section should be this. And I did that. And then it got published. And I could not believe it. Then I did a story on Gabby Hoffman. I was like trying to do a lateral, yeah. oh, child star. I see a theme here. You see, you're like, well, that sells. I'm going yeah, to try to like I'm, like, I'm good at that. I'm good at like, oh, it, yeah. like I'm, a good, I'm like an Amazon algorithm. Like for those who bought the Zasha Mamet profile, consider yeah. my <laughs> Gabby Hoffman profile. That's true. I did that story. And then I did a story about Max Brooks. So mm. I did these three stories that especially Gabby and Max, I had a very good handle on. Max, I think, was my first thing that I handed in that was very, very good when I handed it in. Um, And because I had a patient editor, the Gabby Hoffman, he was like, here's what you should do instead. And when he said that, like, I suddenly understood what a profile should be. Mm -hmm. Like, it didn't have to be this, like, introduction to the world. You could pick up in the middle. You could, you didn't have to have a boring bio section that told you everything you needed to know. Just assume this person is interested. Here's, here's everything interesting that I thought and learned during this process. The Gabby Hoffman story did very, very well. And when I was introduced to Mark Lotto, he, at, GQ. at GQ, we did a round of 100 emails back and forth about things we liked and things we loved and writing that we loved. And I had these two ideas. I wanted to write a story about Britney Spears going to Las Vegas. She was like, just announced. And I was like, what is Britney Spears doing in Las Vegas? He said GQ wouldn't go for that. It's not new enough. And we've covered her. Right. And, In 1994. Yeah. uh, Like and all the way through. And she's not going to, and she's not a good talker. Mm -hmm. And then I had this idea that I, I'd seen on Twitter, Paula Dean had put out a tweet. She'd been in exile for however Mm -hmm. long. She put out a tweet that said, 
I'm having a cruise. Join us on the white sandy beaches. And I was like, white sandy beaches? Nobody is steering this ship. And yeah. I got on top of that. And he was like, they won't do that either. But then a couple months later, Mark Lotto left to start Matter, which was the long form arm of Medium, mm -hmm. like the kind of prestige project of it. And the first day he said, let's do those stories. And we right. did. And it was amazing. And those stories also put me on, on the map. And between Gabby Hoffman and that, I, I got a call from Devin Gordon again saying, it's Nicki Minaj time. Yeah. And I was like, yes, it is. <laughs> that was yes, your first is. big. That was my first GQ piece. GQ and piece. I handed it in that next day. And I should also say that I handed it in over the course of the last week I had moved from LA to New Jersey. I was sitting on boxes. My children were totally neglected. I hadn't even enrolled them in school yet. I was just like, I'm sorry, but this is my shot at GQ yeah. Kids. And I sent it in and the next day they called me and asked if I wanted to be on contract. I think I was the last contract offered there. Wow. Yeah, and it was a miracle. Off of one story. They, and they said it was the first time anyone had ever gotten a contract before the story was published. I was very proud of that. And I went back to the New York Times Magazine. Adam Sternberger had left for New York Magazine. And I said, GQ wants to put me on contract. Like, do you guys? Because I loved working at the New York Times Magazine. I was so proud to be there. Yeah. And I was so proud of also, the work I was doing so there. many people see it. When you write for the New York Times. It's, you can't believe it. Like, how many the people way read people it? bring the thunder yeah. when you've done it. I, you can't believe it. I right. mean, it's funny. I talk, I'm talking romantically about GQ. But the New York Times Magazine, like the way a story there can move the world was astounding to me that like, especially recently, my Weight Watchers, like say what you want about print media, but the way a magazine story can still change the world is something immense to me. Right. So there's two themes I hear. One is that if you're an um, aspiring writer and you're sort of looking at Taffy's career as a, uh -huh. as, a, as a model. And one is that you made very good relationships with your editors so that yeah. when they, I was never a pain in the ass. I was never, never, I never filed late. I filed all in one font. I spell checked. Right. I was, I took edits. Like, I think that's like a thing that I hear is people don't take edits, meaning it's not that I don't push back against things or insist on things. It's that you hear a lot how people resist just the entire process of editing, which is always strange to me because here are these very talented, high placed people. Adam Sternberg was a genius at this stuff. When he left the New York Times to go write at New York Magazine, what I said was, this is like when, when Daniel Day-Lewis uh, went to be a cobbler. Like it, 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 your, your writing will do me no good. I need you as an editor in this world. <laughs> And he was he was just so good at it. They're all Devin Gordon, Mark Lotto, they are geniuses at what they do. And by the time I hand something in, it represents my absolute best effort. I have sweated over it. I have bled over it. But here come this group of people who will try to make this as good as it possibly could be without taking any credit for it. Like that's right. to me, like, and still it's just your name on it. I don't understand why people resist edits. And I think that people. No, I've never resisted it. And maybe it's because I've been on the other side. I know what. It yeah, you were an ass. editor. Yeah. Well, what a pain in the ass it is when you have a writer that doesn't want to just do what you say. You're busy right. and it's like, you know right. better. I hear about annoying. people who are like, if you edit this, I'm going to pull this story. And I'm in like, awe of that. Shocking. But I'm also like, how, who, where do you get that you have the perfect that no yeah. one should be able to ask questions about this. It's incredible. The other thing that you're, you're just a prolific with your ideas. Like you just have I, a lot of ideas. I have a lot of ideas. And I, just, that comes from living with Claude. Like Claude can look at anything and say, that's a story. Claude could look Claude at is like, your husband. Claude is my husband. <laughs> We've established him. Yes. His, oh yeah, we have. His we name, his bachelor name. Yeah. Um, that like, you know, the guys could, the guys who are supposed to pick up garbage on Tuesdays and Fridays, two weeks in a row, Miss Friday, and he will have something interesting to say about it in the economy. I picked that up from him. The other day I was at the office and my New York Times job, and I was talking about the Springsteen Broadway show. And everyone is like, well, he just wanted, you know, he wanted to just kind of settle down and have something quiet. 
that's near his house that, and I, and my thought having been Claude's wife Mm -hmm. (laughs) was to be more like uh, skeptical of that. And I started to wonder, you know, it used to be a musician could only make money touring and the, that the record companies got wind of that. And so they started to take a piece of a bigger piece of the tour. They have these 360 deals now so that the musician doesn't still does not make that much enough money or uh, an appropriate amount of money for the effort. Um, you know, it could still be millions of dollars, but it's someone else is getting far richer off the person's effort. And I thought maybe the Broadway show is a way to exempt from like, did the 360 deal include Broadway? Mm-hmm. That was like a question I had that that someone seemed at the at the office seemed impressed with. And I thought that's like Claude. Like right. Claude would be looking Claude would not ever have the generous view of Springsteen just wants to be closer to home. Right. He, he just wants a really. commute like I have. Like, hey, it's 32 minutes on the train to Penn Station. Then right. you're right there. <laughs> I that mean, would, yeah. that's not like. Do you write these ideas down? Because like, you have like these ideas like shooting in your brain. You just... Yeah. And I also never worry that I'm going to run out of them. Right. And that makes you less cheap with your ideas. That means you could talk about them. Like I, the thing I just said now is not even something written or right. signed. Like. I just don't steal it. Don't steal it, please. (laughs) We'll know that you do. Um, But I don't believe that people steal ideas. I just don't. I really believe that the more generous you are in this business or maybe in life, the more generous the world will be with you. The way I got Adam Sternberg's email address was because I had given someone else an email address. Right. I see the writers who are like, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I can't introduce you. I can't, if yeah. someone's a good writer, I will introduce them in a second. I mean, I think I, intru- did yeah. I introduce you to Steve Even, Randall maybe? Yeah. You introduced me yeah. to Steve Randall. You've introduced me to people and I introduced you to people yeah. in your career. Right. Like that's what we do. <laughs> One of the things you do is you come up with ideas and you're very good at figuring out where should I pitch this idea. Mm-hmm. Um, because you've written for a lot of different, yeah, I've written like, for like everywhere. many, many more than I have. So, but how do you figure out like this story would be good here and this story would be good there? When I was starting out, I would read those magazines and I would ask myself in each magazine, what do I have to contribute to this magazine? It wasn't that the idea came first. It was, what do I have to contribute to this magazine? Because it seemed like a numbers game. Like I just wanted to get as much out there as possible. And I had so much to say. That's mm-hmm. the thing. Like. Breathlessly, I had so much to say, and I wanted to say. It's so almost much. like pent up for all these years. I know. It's like just media bistro, now. and you're like, "Oh my god, I get to write about to get paid too." Yeah, it was really crazy. And then, and I was good at sounding like the place. And it was when Mark Lotto hired me at Matter. I said, "Well, what do you want this to sound like?" Because it didn't exist yet. Like it didn't launch until after both my stories were in. And he said, "I want it to just sound like you." and the loosest version of you. And I thought like, I panicked because I didn't have, I didn't know how I sounded. I knew how I sounded trying to sound like other places. And then I looked back at my recent clips and thought, you know what, that's not true. I sound specifically like me. And slowly I chose to stop working at places that made me sound like them. Mm-hmm. But like now I am someone who sounds like me. You have your voice. Yeah. I have my voice. And if you are trying to like the women's magazine thing where it's like sound like the girlfriend who knows more These than the days. reader. Yeah. It's like so who wants that? Like have an intelligent conversation. Think of your reader. Jonathan Franzen says this. Think of your reader as your friend. Someone who is kind of as desperate for answers as you are. Someone who is as confused and lonely and isolated and weird as you are. That's who you're writing to. You're writing to yourself. And yet sometimes when you get assigned those women's magazines, you sort of do have to adopt that voice. Or you can stop doing it. Or you can just stop. Or you can stop. There was one day where I stopped doing it. There were still a couple of editors I would work for. Like I will always work for Sarah Austin. She was at Self, then at Cosmo. Now she's at Real Simple. And I don't have much to contribute to Real Simple. But if you look around this house, you can see that I am not a candidate for the Real Simple. (laughs) I would be lying. Anything I wrote would be a lie. So now for you, it's about the editor. Now it's like, I only want to, like, that's what has happened for me is that I only want to write for people. Those are like the most intimate relationships. And it becomes a transcendent experience for me. Like it is so fulfilling to me. And the other thing just drains me. Yeah. And exhausts me. And I did it. I think that's the thing you have to think of as a freelancer 
is something you can't believe you got into self. You can't believe you got into glamour. You can't believe you got into this place. But there is going to be a time where it's no longer good enough, meaning you are no longer someone who has something to contribute there. And you have to know that. You have to, if you, I know a lot of freelancers. I know so many writers. And the ones who are like, I can't throw this contract away, even though it's eating at me. Those are the ones who are miserable doing what they're doing. I don't blame them, but I wish they would take a, a bigger leap. Yeah. Well, I think that's really what you've done that a lot of, you took it to one extra level that a lot of my freelance friends didn't, where you really write, you found your voice and you really write what you want to write rather than what other people want you to that's write. That's a privilege that comes after you spend a lot of time filing on time and being nice and not being right. a monster and compromising. And also it comes with a lot of hard work and, and being prolific is a factor. If you, in all this time, if you only wrote four stories a year, no one would know all the ways you are capable of contributing. Right. So that was all worth it for me. So you wrote a lot for GQ. Mm -hmm. GQ is your main sort no, of... No, GQ... So that day that GQ offered me the contract, the New York Times Magazine said, oh, well, we want you on contract yeah. too, which was... Or maybe I was like, you'd better... You should put me on contract because <laughs> uh, how dare you? I know. I've been, you know... They, October 1st, 2014, they both put me on contract. It was... I could not believe it's how happy same I day? was. The same day. It was the contracts were signed the same day. I couldn't believe. And what does a contract mean that you're for that you have it's to? It's different for both places. So GQ, it means that a sum of money will be deposited into your account. No way. Once a month without the taxes taken out, which is dangerous. <laughs> and that you will have to write a certain amount of stories for them. And then for the New York Times Magazine, it's that you have to pitch your story to them first before you pitch it to a competitor and that you are like, you are kind of preferred status with them and yeah. that they will offer you something first Yeah, and you get paid your story fee, 50% of it upfront, which makes a huge difference. Meaning yeah. you don't have to wait till yeah. the end of the story to get paid, even though at the end of the story you get paid the other half in your Twitter bio, it says you're on contract with the New York times magazine yeah. and GQ. And that's, that's like, a big deal. that's what, and then you start winning awards. I put myself up for awards. <laughs> Oh, you, you know, did. is that funny? Like, I don't think I was ever, I won an award that I didn't put myself up for. I was very, uh, Mark Lotto put my Britney Spears story up for an ASME and it yeah. did not get nominated. And I don't think anyone's put me up for an ASME since then. Maybe Cosmo did about an essay I wrote about OCD, Sarah Austin mm -hmm. again. Um, but I didn't, I've never been nominated and, and I'm a big believer in being a member of your press club. And so the New York press club has awards. I was like, ah, yeah. we'll do this. Gabby Hoffman was the first award story. and I was, I was so proud of that. Like, I don't know how to feel about the fact that I've put, that I submitted myself, but I think that's what freelancers have to do. That's interesting. I didn't realize that you had done that. And I, it makes me feel like, why have I not submitted myself? All A lot of years? people don't. And like with good reason, like well, someone, sh someone there should do it for you. But they yeah, don't. but they but don't. They don't. Yeah. And everybody's busy. And, and then it makes everybody look good if you win. So yeah. Or they don't care. Like that's the other thing that you can like, sometimes you can say like, Hey guys, I won this award. They'll be excited for you. They'll come with you to the award. Right. Right. But I don't know if it mat if it matters that much. I think that there are certain awards that matter to them, but I don't know if it like a press club award. Yeah. Okay. So now let's cut to, well, two big things happen. One is that you took a full time job. Ah, yes. Your first full time job since media bistro. Yeah. <laughs> you took a full time job as a staff writer for the New York Times Arts and Leisure. Arts and Leisure. Okay. And the magazine. And the magazine. Yeah. It's like two full-time jobs. And you have to go to the office to do this. No, I don't have to go to the office. I go to the office like once a week or so to meet with people. And then I go to the magazine for their meeting. Did you ever for a moment hesitate to take the... Uh, to oh, yes. That job. I did. I said no to it a couple of times. Really? Um, yeah. Why? Because, because I loved working at GQ and it wouldn't allow me to do that. And I didn't think that the newspaper would let me do, tell a story the way I wanted to. I was worried about like throwing all my eggs into one basket. Is that the cliche? Um, I didn't think I wanted this job. The job was 3000 word profiles once a month for arts and leisure. And I don't think I'm good at 3000 words. That's that was the first hesitation. Why? 
too too short. Too short. I am not um, like what's a GQ like, piece? How many? Like fifth? Between four and six. Oh wow. Okay. And I just I'm meandering, and I like to go on tangents. And then one day, you know, I thought about it a lot. There were some things going on at Condé Nast that were making me nervous. Condé Nast owns GQ. And the offer just kept getting better. Then I like woke up one day and was like, wait, what? I'm saying no to a job. Like what happened was also that they were hiring me at Arts and Leisure. And I said, I, I know I'm known for doing culture profiles, but I really have like these other, I had just published this Weight Watcher story. I published that um, footstep story mm-hmm. in April that I was enormously proud of Your about, story about the people, w- people oh. leaving ultra orthodoxy. Yeah. I was so proud of that. And there were other little things along the way. I had done something about the U.S.'s lone male synchronized swimmer, a, a story that I was so proud of for ESPN, the magazine. And now I just how did didn't you find that story. How do you I, find that story? I will tell story? you how I found that story, but I'll tell, but I'll finish this thought oh, yeah, first. Sorry. And I said, I can't do this job unless I'm also still working for the magazine and the magazine. I love my editor. And I also could not bear to say goodbye to him. My editor at the magazine. I love the editor in chief, Jake Silverstein, mm-hmm. my, my editor, oh. Mike Benoit. And he, I just didn't want to say goodbye to them. I just couldn't. I was so, and I was so proud. Again, like, right. look what a magazine story could do. Right. And there was a part of me that thought, you know, writing twelve stories a year for Arts and Leisure plus four stories for the New York Times Magazine is still half of what I did last year. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I was so frantic to keep money coming in that I just would take things, take yeah. things, and it was time for me to like ask myself, like, what could you do if you had more time? What if you could do something amazing? And I guess that's what I'll find out. So the magazine stepped in and made like contributed to the offer. And so now I am kind of three quarters arts and leisure, a quarter magazine and very, very proud of it. I also thought that my children deserved some sort of, you know, for the duration of their lives, I have been running around doing different stories. If I had an opportunity to slow down and I didn't take it. I don't know how I would think of myself. You know, they're getting older. Right. The older one turns 10 tomorrow. The synchronized swimmer story. This is how I found that story. I was teaching a personal essay class and someone there named Izita, she was working on a book. She was an academic working on a book about like a history of the breath. Mm-hmm. Of like, you know, yoga people and yeah. uh, deep divers. And she would bring in a chapter. She would took the class several times and every time she would workshop a chapter. And one of the chapters was about synchronized swimming. And I said, this is an amazing story. How they breathe and how they control their breath and with it, whether or not they pass out. It's one of the most rigorous athletic achievements to be able to do that. Because you're underwater for up to 45 seconds. You emerge, you have a smile on your face. It was like, to me, it was so great. And a year after she took the class, I was poking around online and I saw that there was a man who had left synchronized swimming, like one of the only male synchronized swimmers left because it looked like the Olympics was never, ever going to allow him in. Mm -hmm. Because even the world championships, the qualifying event wouldn't allow him in. in. After he retired, he moved to Vegas. He was doing Cirque du Soleil shows. And they called him up one day and they said, you know what? We're going to let you into world championships. So in his late 30s, they're like, can you do it? He was like, yes, this is all he ever wanted. He could have. He was an incredible athlete who could have done water polo, diving, yeah. anything. But this was like where his heart was. And that was so beautiful to me. Yeah. I called up Izita and I said, I just read this. And she said, oh, I I interviewed that guy for the breath story. I reread her story and I said, I want you to know that this is a great story. And if you would like to pitch it, now is the time to pitch it and I will help you. Yeah. You're a good teacher. But no, I'm not. Listen, listen to what I said. Next. I said, but if you're not going to, I'm taking this story. Like if you're not going to do this story, you're I a, want it. You're not a very good teacher. <laughs> I'm not a very good teacher. And she said, I would love for you to tell the story. And I said, no, don't do it. I said, I'm giving you a week to think about it. I will help you. I will leverage connections. We could do this. Right. And she said, no, 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 I don't want to do it. That's not what she wants to do. Like not everyone wants to do this where I do it. She wanted to publish this book. But she said, no, I like I give you my blessing. Go tell this story. 
I pitched it to GQ. They didn't want it. I pitched it to the New York Times Magazine. They didn't want it. I pitched it to ESPN, the magazine. And they're like, 8,000 words, please. And by the way, it was 8,000 words. And it's like a wonderful place to work and a great experience. And they publish great, great stuff. They sent me to Russia. Like they sent me everywhere to do this story. And then they devoted 12 magazine pages to this story. I was so proud of this story. It was the most beautiful thing I had ever witnessed. To see a person who believed their dream had come and gone to then have a chance at it. And he won. He became a world champion. Mm. And I was the maybe the only American. It was like Rocky IV. I was, Where was screaming. This? It was in Russia. Russia. It was in Kazan, Russia. Oh like a disputed territory <laughs> in Russia. Yeah. And I sprained my ankle jumping up and down. And I did not care. I have never felt more patriotic. I have never seen a more beautiful moment in my life. Oh, that's wonderful. Tell me about the interview that you did with Tom Hiddleston, because you became quite a celebrity in the English tabloids. After his much publicized relationship end with Grammy Award winning singer Taylor Swift, Tom Hiddleston can't wait to get his hands on another woman. He was seen hugging a mysterious woman in London that captured a few passerby's attention. The brunette was seen chatting and giggling with the Golden Globe Award winning actor at the corner of a dimly lit street. The conversation got deeper and so did their coziness. The actor then hugged her tight to bid her goodbye who responded with smiles and hugged him at the frosty weather. Explain what happened. Um, I was interviewing him at his home and at the end of the evening he walked me outside and I waited for an Uber and he was doing an impression. Yeah. He does good impressions. He was doing an impression of me was to me. Was he incredibly me. charming? He was so charming, but also so smart. Yeah. And so kind and so decent. And like, I spent two days, we, both days we walked five miles and then ended up at his house. Was that his idea? Yeah. He wanted to walk. And okay. he, you can, if you are very, very famous, even if you are even a Marvel superhero or villain as he is, you can walk around England and it's fine. Like Doesn't people will give you a thumbs up, but yeah. nobody will chase you. And I hugged him goodbye and he was doing an impression of me to me. And I was laughing at it. And a week later I was in New Jersey driving my children home from basketball practice. And I got a call from Katie Weaver, um, who is GQ's best writer, in addition to all the other best writers. And she screamed. K Katie loves tabloids. Yeah. And she loves like a real, like she loves a Bravo series. She has like a yeah. real dedication to these things. She could barely speak. She screamed, you are a mystery brunette. And I said, what? And she just like, it came out in gasps that I, there were in the, in the daily mail, there were pictures of me filed under mystery brunette. Like Tom Hiddleston says goodbye to after emerging from like, it was like totally, there were like 10 pictures. And I have I to say, them. it was like, the it thing. was the craziest thing. And then like the New York Post, everyone knew who I was immediately right. because everyone in yeah. New York media knows me. The New York Post called me for comment. And I, I think I said to them, my family and I um, request privacy during this hilarious time. Yeah. And that then made the rounds. And right. it was what people forget is that it was during inauguration week. So it was like a miserable week. Yeah. And then this crazy, hilarious right, thing it. where this like 41 year old New Jersey mom is being missed. It was like, yeah. it was the most. You was, were the mystery. It was that. the. It Had was, you ever talked to him about that? Yeah, he called me up and he said, I see what's going on. I'm so sorry. I would like to apologize to your husband. I meant, I hope you understand, he understands there's no disrespect and I am horrified and I can only imagine what you're going through. And I said, Tom, <laughs> this has been the best week of my life. <laughs> like, you should try to enjoy this right. more. This is amazing. Yeah, like, yeah, I no. please do not shut it down. I am really enjoying this. <laughs> That's the best. <laughs> All right. Um, so now you are where you are. What would the sort of taffy now say to the taffy of 
Soap Opera Digest. Like, what would, what would you tell your young weekly? Taffy? Oh, soap Opera Weekly. I'm sorry. Soap Opera Digest. I, this is what I would say. I would say that you're that you should tell a real story, and that your instincts to tell a real story are good. Most people's are, and every way that they fail or don't succeed is by overriding those instincts and telling a different story. And also that, you know, what story do they tell? You think, I think they tell the story that sounds like, I think they, these days they're like, here's how I will, I will imitate this thing to get, to become part of this thing, which is something you have to do in a way to prove that you belong there. And yet it doesn't create great success. It creates uh, some success. Mm-hmm. So what I would say to anyone, and not me, because I, I had a very supportive husband who kept saying, don't do anything you don't want to do. Like mm. you will only tell good stories that you want to tell. But the people who don't have that person in their lives, like only do stories that speak to you. There are other stories you have to do as you're coming up, but just know that if you keep an eye on that, if you remember what you want, if you remember what success looks like to you, you'll be able to find it when it's offered to you mm-hmm. or when there is an opportunity for it. That's what I guess. Yeah, and also like good. that, like, this is what I think. I think that I was just speaking to a 26 year old that I know and care about very deeply who keeps saying to me, how did you figure out what you wanted to do? And I didn't plan this. I didn't plan that when I have children, I will start doing this. I just think that there are some things you have to live through before you get there. And so you can't predict it. You can just kind of try to remember what you wanted to do in the first place. Mm -hmm. Keep it in the back of your head and see it coming. Yeah. Taffy, Ackner, Brodesser. No. Taffy Ackner. No. Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Yes. <laughs> you were at my wedding. Let me see. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Taffy Brodesser Ackner. Thank you for joining me. This has been incredible. John, this has been wonderful. Thank you. I love it. I love it too. <laughs> listening to Write About Now, hosted by my dad, Jonathan Small. If you like what you heard, please subscribe to his podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, or wherever you may find podcasts. Or you can go to his website, writeaboutnowmedia.com. And listen there, this is Ella, reminding you to do do the the right thing. thing! Thank you.